Rwanda, a beautiful country with a tragic past. Welcome to Talk to Al Jazeera. I'm Andrew Simmons. In a moment, I'll be talking to President Paul Kagame. He's just won a second seven-year term in office. It was a resounding victory, a majority of 93.8%. President Kagame is credited with turning this country around after the horrors of the 1994 genocide. Rwanda is now well developed with a thriving economy, but critics say the price for that is a flawed democracy. Mr. Kagame has been accused by human rights groups of suppressing critical media, arresting those who challenge his ruling party, and barring some candidates from the elections. There are also allegations hotly denied by Mr. Kagame that he's had a hand in violence against opponents. President Paul Kagame, welcome to Talk to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Now, you've just been elected for another seven-year term as president. What are your main priorities going to be? My main priorities are going to be consolidation of uh, a number of areas where we have made uh, very good progress in the social and economic uh, development, uh, in areas of governance, in ensuring that we continue on the growth path and uh, attract more investments, uh, uh, increase our trade within the region and beyond, and make sure that our people are more productive uh, in different sectors, in agriculture and other areas. No one would criticize you for your record on development. But as you know, there is a lot of criticism about your record on democracy. There are even some suggestions that you've turned from a liberation fighter into a civilian autocrat. What do you say to all of this criticism? I would say that um, I don't agree with that assertion. And the evidence is also what the people of Rwanda say about how we have worked together, the leadership, the people, to develop our country and not only in social and economic areas, also in the area of governance and democratization. It does seem remarkably coincidental that there is a number of incidents of violence ahead of the election. Do you categorically deny any involvement, not necessarily personally, but on the part of the party, in any of these incidents? Absolutely no, because my party Myself, our government does not violate human rights. It's about building and developing our country. We are not going to develop democracy just because some journalists or some government or official from outside or from a developed country has asked questions about the democracy. Because after all, this democracy people talk about is good for who? It's good for the people where democracy is taking place. And should anyone think that we don't understand that? I don't agree. So are you saying that, that democracy is immature, it's fledgling in your country? I do not understand. If anybody followed and saw the expressions of Rwandans and how they came out freely to participate in the elections, to choose and to define the path to their future. But that's the point. Many are saying, and I'm not just picking the word many up from anywhere, uh, the Commonwealth is somewhat concerned. You recently joined the Commonwealth. They're slightly concerned about this rate of development in terms of democracy. Uh, the choice, aren't you stopping the electorate from getting a really free range of choice by your tactics, your hardline tactics. Let's properly interpret what is happening in Rwanda. What tactics? We have allowed Rwandans to choose their leaders. We have devolution of powers in Rwanda. Decentralization policies here in Rwanda work better than anywhere else. I want you to tell me where it works better than that. That means we are giving power to the people to decide for themselves. But can you really be proud of this victory when you really had weak opposition 
that seem to be very sympathetic towards the RPF anyway? Well, I'm not responsible for the weak opposition. The weak op if, if the opposition is weak, it's because they are weak. I cannot be ashamed of my strength just because somebody else is weak. I, I don't know, I don't understand the principle, I don't understand the logic. They have not become weak at my expense. I have become strong based on my own abilities. Let's, let's get then to the core of this for the benefit of our viewers and let's be a bit right. more specific about uh, individuals. Victoire Inga Berry. Inga Berry, fine. Uh, yes. In this instance, she's uh, confined uh, to the capital. She can't leave and she's facing charges of denying She genocide. should actually be in prison, only that... Well, tell me, the, tell me the, why the, the, her the, party the, can't this I'm contest to. this election. Yes, the, in this the process of law has to be respected. Victoire Ngabire came and wanted to become a presidential candidate, that's fine. Wanted to form a party, that's fine. And there are two things. One, you want to form a party, there is a process. She failed on what the party stands for. The party stands for division of the country along ethnic lines that have created problems in the past. But before even that, the issue was, what is this person? Who is she? What? And the record is very clear. This woman has been working with terrorists in, that have been based in the Congo, the FDRR. What about the Democratic Green Party then? Why was this party stopped from competing in the election? Again, it is, it is their own fault. For a party to be, for, to be formed, what? Well, sympathy. People organize, you have to have at least 200 people supporting that party. They hold a general assembly. Then the notary will verify that. And the party, then the, the documents will be deposited with the local government that oversees this. And the matter will go to cabinet. And then the party will be formed. That's how parties have been formed, all of them, including. The RPA. So you're saying they could have been formed if they'd they formed the right procedure? They failed to do that. Now I'd like to deal now with the dark shadow that still hangs over Rwanda after 16 years, and that's the genocide. It's something that's taboo here in terms of discussion. Please describe to our viewers how it works that you have a law where you can face charges for displaying any ethnic differences. Yeah, let me start by saying I don't know of any country in this world where they take pride in singing, in praising divisions in a society, whether along tribal or ethnic or religious lines. I don't know of that. <laughs> but some people think here it should be the case. Yet here is where we have lived a life that has taught, at le taught us lessons uh, that um, political divisions, ethnic division, and people playing politics uh, with that has resulted into the loss of one million people we've lost here in Rwanda. We have the laws. We allow people, for example, and there's a confusion here again. Sometimes people think we have even stopped people, you know, saying, you know, they, they may call themselves Hutus or Tutsis or Tuas. No, it's not what we have said. We have said, you cannot use what you are, or what, what you want to call yourself, to the detriment of the other who is different from you. This is all we have said. And we have a legitimate right to do that. And what do you say to those who accuse you of using the laws of genocide as a means of political manipulation in suppressing freedom of speech. I, I would only say to them that they are ignorant, absolutely ignorant. If not, they are insensitive. If not, they have bad intentions. 
certainly I don't doubt their intelligence. I, I don't doubt people's intelligence. I think people are intelligent and they understand. So I don't think they don't understand, but they have other issues to deal with. But they won't stop us moving forward and dealing with our issues the way we should deal with them and the best way we think we should deal with them. President Kagame, we're going to have to take a short break here. We'll be back soon here on Talk to Al Jazeera. Welcome back to Talk to Al Jazeera with me, Andrew Simmons, and President Paul Kagame. Now, economic development, you have a remarkable record in Rwanda, a tremendous turnaround. Can you sustain the sort of growth we've seen recently in your next term? Yes, we can sustain the growth because it is based on good policies. It is based on the understanding of these policies and involvement. Uh, of people. Um, so there is no reason why this will not continue. You've said, haven't you, that you want this country to become effectively like the Asian tiger, maybe, for example, Singapore, a service industry, not reliant on, uh, on iron ore or minerals because you have little resources here. Is that the case? Can you do that? That is the case, and we have found that it is, it is feasible because of the investments we make in our people through education, provision of good health, and investment in the kinds of infrastructure that actually support the services and using the human skills that we are developing, I don't see uh, any limit to uh, continued progress. Now what about foreign relations in particular with the Democratic Republic of Congo? Um, they're your neighbours, you are landlocked. How are things progressing now with President Kabila? Well before you come to President Kabila, it is important. Regional integration uh, helps uh, us to resolve some of the issues related to being landlocked and therefore we in any case, we don't uh, confine ourselves to the East African community. We also work with other neighbors quite well. Now, that brings in the picture the uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, we have made tremendous progress uh, in building a good relationship, or even rather rebuilding it, because we have had a good relationship in the past, in the early years, uh, after the change from Mobutu to a new uh, era. So today we enjoy a good relationship between uh, DRC and Rwanda. We have reopened embassies in the two capitals. We have our institutions and uh, officials working together in different areas uh, that uh, have uh, uh, given rise to stability and uh, development. On that point of peace and security, the humanitarian crisis in eastern Congo is still colossal. The FDLR plays a part in that. You uh, were involved in a joint operation uh, early in 2009. Is there a need for a change in tactics? Well, I should say that this development in, in, in good relationships has certainly uh, made it easy uh, for the two countries to focus on how they can deal with uh, this issue. And yes, but words are words. Is, where is the action? When, when are we going to see Well, I think some the action is, is reflected in the results that the situation probably is not as bad today as it used to be two years ago, for example. But that doesn't mean that we are where we are, or the Congo is where it is supposed to be in terms of, uh, you know, peace and security in that region, and therefore allowing the people to, you know, uh, go about their businesses in Eastern Congo. There's still a lot of work to do. Coming back to early in 2009, the arrest of Nkunda, that was a big development. He's still here. He's under house arrest, effectively. When will he face justice? The big development wasn't the arrest of Nkunda. I think it was the... Uh, achievement uh, of stabilizing 
Eastern Congo and developing this new relationship and positive relationship between Rwanda and DRC and managing even other issues uh, bigger than Hunda, and that is the security of Eastern Congo, the reintegration of uh, the different groups that were opposed to the government. But in you were more an ally so to, to Nkunda, weren't you, prior to that decision? <laughs> I think there was a bit of a, an exaggeration relating to that. Um, I think there was more of imagination of what we could have been doing with Hunda that was not happening, simply because of uh, uh, very historical matters where there are Congolese in Congo of Rwandese origin and therefore relationships cut across. So what one is doing there is imagined to be associated in one way or originating from uh, the other side. We don't want him to stay here forever or his case unresolved forever and we are looking at legal issues, diplomatic issues, political issues related to that. With respect, that does sound diplomatic. Can you answer the question, when will he face justice? Or will he face justice? The, the issue is not even in Honda facing justice. I think the issue is, that's why I'm saying it is finding a solution. Because if you just stick to issues of justice, 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 you'll probably have hundreds, if not thousands of people who you, you, you may have to pursue. There are some who say that he'll never uh, face justice, he'll never talk publicly in a courtroom because he knows so much about so many aspects yeah, but to what's happened as in you that say that, region. As you say that, Africa. I even don't know who is actually seeking to put him to justice. Who is it that you know? We have, for example, had no request from anybody that they want to put him to justice. Kinshasa so, has indicated it wants to extradite him. No, but they are the ones we are working with to resolve the matter. <laughs> so to ask me that <laughs> when is he being put to justice, I'm not the one to put him to justice. So that's why the two states are involved in finding a solution, whether it is justice or other ways of managing his case that has much wider implications, mainly political and mainly inside the Congo itself, not here in Rwanda. I'd like to move now, still with foreign relations, the diplomatic issue with South Africa right now. And General Fustan uh, Kayambwa uh, Neamwasa. Um, now you're accusing him of being a criminal. He was a one-time ally of, of yours. What is happening here? And what is your viewpoint towards South African relations? There are two officers who are fugitives and who are that's Patrick Karagea as well. Patrick Karagea and uh, Nyamwasa. And uh, the circumstances leading to their being in South Africa have been discussed extensively. They have been associated with activities that would destabilize our country. When they fled and went to South Africa, we've raised these issues with the South African government and brought to their attention all matters leading to their being where they are as fugitives. And we have sought through the diplomatic channels with South Africa to have these people brought back and be tried. What is their motivation in wanting to bring your government down as the words of uh, one of them, they want to declare war on Rwanda? The only thing I know is um, they are running away from being held accountable. Do you think South Africa is acting responsibly in the way it's investigating the attempted murder of one of these officers? We were already engaging South Africans over this case. So the, the, the attempted murder case is one aspect of the much bigger case. Really, for me, I'm not even looking at the attempted murder case. I'm looking at the case of these two officials who we are told are supposed to be uh, having an asylum status or pursuing that. Uh, I don't know the details yet. And yet they are using the South African territory to organize and continue carrying out activities aimed at destabilizing our country and even arrogantly making these announcements from South Africa. And, and normally this would not happen 
in a situation of uh, two friendly countries, and we are trying to therefore address this matter with South Africa. And uh, we want. Could this escalate? Uh, Will you withdraw your ambassador from? I don't Pretoria? think it is. I don't think escalation is in anybody's interest. I'd like now to touch on the inner Paul Kagame at this time when you've got another seven-year term ahead of you. Now you have a military background, but in all honesty, would you describe yourself as the hard man of Rwanda, as you're portrayed, as the tough guy? Uh, so, uh, I, I think I would describe myself first as a very honest Rwandan and committed Rwandan. To the point that whatever I do, first of all, I put first the trust and the confidence the people have in me to serve them. The second is that I don't do it as a machine. I'm also a person. I'm a human being. I have my understanding of issues that not only affect the people that I serve, that also affect me, even personally, at a personal level. So, for the way we have dealt with some of the issues, it's because that's the way they have to be dealt with. And I do not think, we, we, for example, we have had many victories in so many circumstances. The victory you earn through hardships probably is not the same victory you have when you have th things the easy way. And finally, I'd like to ask you, you have seven years ahead of you. Could you tell us on this program that you won't turn like some African leaders and change the constitution and go for another term and effectively just really not want to give up power? I even question why people have to keep asking this question. Uh, as if, and you see, it is full of hypocrisy. While I have expressed my views about it, what I will do and what I will not do, I think there is a lot of hypocrisy. In what sense? Except a few areas in the whole world, in developed countries. Some of those countries don't have term limits of their leaders. Right? Maybe it is right because these are developed countries. Number two, we have even seen in European countries people changing their constitutions. I have my own issues why I would personally not want to tamper with the constitution. So you will stand down after seven years? What does the constitution suggest? <laughs> you see, I'm, I, I, I'm again coming to the point of saying, why, why do you expect me to be thinking about tampering with the Constitution? Why, why does anybody doubt my intention? I simply asked you. <laughs> okay. No, I won't. <laughs> I want to do that. President Kagame, thank you very much indeed for joining us on Talk to Al Jazeera. Thank you. And thank you very much indeed for watching. Goodbye from me, Andrew Sitton.